Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Y'all having a good time? Oh, come on, man. Did you have too big a lunch or something? Good afternoon. How are you doing? Okay, good. Much better, much better. Okay, I am here to introduce a man that probably needs no introduction whatsoever. He is the best-selling author of The Primal Blueprint, and um, he's a real good friend of mine, Mr. Mark Sisson. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to live an awesome life. Now, recently, I took the Primal Blueprint, and I sort of did a little uh, weekend reflection, and I thought, what is the Primal Blueprint really about? And it is about extracting the most joy and contentment and satisfaction and fulfillment from life as possible. So we decided that uh, that would be our new mission, is to figure out ways in which we could not just get this for ourselves, but to teach this to other people. So we are going to talk a little bit today about uh, what got us here. We're going to dig deep into the, into the essence and history of Paleo and Primal and come up with a couple of maybe uh, ideas or tweaks for you uh, to think about maybe incorporating as you go forward into your lives and figure out what the next thing is for you to live an awesome life. This, by the way, this, by the way is my son Kyle. He's 21 now, and he's uh, diving for a Frisbee, which is sort of what we do at my family. Um, so, how do you feel? No, really, how do you feel? All right, there we go. So when I ask that question, you know, yeah, I feel good, I feel okay. No, I mean, I, I, how do you feel? Do you feel energetic? Are you pain-free? Are you guilt-free? Are you not sitting there thinking, oh, I shouldn't have had those chips for lunch? Or that, that omelet that was cooked in who knows what oil uh, with who knows what kind of eggs? Are you, are you making choices as you go through your day and go through your life without regrets? Um, are you productive? Is that important to you, to be productive in your life? Because that impacts how we feel, how we feel about ourselves, how we wake up in the morning, whether or not we're, we're happy and ready to hit the ground running, as they say. Um, is there someone in your life or some ones in your life that add meaning, that add fulfillment, uh, that enrich your life, that, that impact you and who's on, upon whom you have an impact. These are all important in, in experiencing the joy of living a primal paleo lifestyle. And yet, some of this seems to have been lost. Um, do you wake up in the morning and are you ready to, ready, to, ready to tackle it? So, the essential question is, how do you feel? Right? Now, I came to this primal blueprint, in my case, and paleo in general, and I suspect many of you did as well, not feeling that great. Uh, I was an endurance athlete. I spent years pursuing racing objectives. I did everything that conventional wisdom suggested I do. I ate the right kind of complex carbohydrates. I put in all the miles. Um, I, I, I avoided fats. Uh, and while I was fit and I looked pretty good naked, I didn't, and I had great blood work. I mean, my blood work was fantastic. My cholesterol levels were good. Uh, my blood pressure was great. My resting heart rate was great. So all of the metrics that science and medicine would have used to establish my fitness as an individual and probably my health and, and my happiness were completely in alignment with what conventional wisdom expected of me, except I felt like crap. And when I say I felt like crap, I had irritable bowel syndrome most of my life. Many of you know this, and for, from the age of 14 to the age of 46, I had severe chronic pains in my gut. I had arthritis in my feet and my hips uh, that eventually went into my fingertips, partly from, we know, from, from the grains that I was eating, but at the time I just assumed it was part of being 46 years old. Um, I had uh, heartburn, GERD on a semi-regular basis. I had upper respiratory tract infections and sinus infections. Most of the time, as I look back on that, 
I didn't feel good. You know, I was, I was going through life with moments of, you know, satisfaction and a little bit of contentment and, and a little bit of joy and a little bit of, of feeling a sense of accomplishment or productivity, but I didn't feel good. And so that's what got me to this amazing research that I've done and a lot of you have helped me with over the last, now it's 30 years, but certainly over the last 10 years. So that gets us to where we are in, in the paleo world. And what we've done was we've taken this conventional wisdom, which you all sort of recognize as being inappropriate advice, and we started to swing the pendulum all the way over to the right. Uh, this whole way of living a, a provided a, a framework for us that appealed to us. And so we, we embraced it. We discovered that um, grains and legumes, which conventional wisdom had said were, should be the basis of a diet, were now probably not as appropriate as we thought. And in fact, many of us shun them entirely. The fats that had been bad, that conventional wisdom had said, you got to stay away from, Wow, now fats are great. The more fat, the better. The more saturated fat, the better. The more omega-3, the better. This is awesome. You know, this is, we, we, can, we can really embrace this. Um, carbohydrates were the basis of a healthy diet, and then all of a sudden we shifted it away. I helped. Uh, to carbohydrates aren't that great. They're certainly not necessary, but they may be the bane of our existence. Uh, to lose weight in the old paradigm, Counting calories, you got to count the calories to lose the weight. In this new system, and we love this one, you don't have to count calories at all. Calories don't matter. Eat what you want, the fat will fall off you. It'll all be awesome. <laughs> Cardio. Ken Cooper wrote his book on aerobics, and everybody embraced, not everybody, but a lot of people, myself included, embraced the concept of putting in the miles on the road. And the more miles you put in, the better it was. Well, we discovered that. A lot of those miles were bad and could be killing us. And so this became this mantra that chronic cardio kills. My bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm partly responsible for that. Uh, and the idea that, that pharma, that medicines were going to help us all live to 125 and medicine would take care of everything and we wouldn't even have to worry about what we ate, we didn't like that. And we embraced this concept that we don't need meds at all. Get it out of here. We're, we're fine as we are. We're going to fix everything. We're going to cure everything just with our diet. So what happened was we embraced this so much, we started to become like overly enthusiastic and almost militant about this. And as much as we were anti the old dogma, we started to create our new dogma. So if low carb was good, then damn it, ketosis is ideal. And a lot of us embraced ketogenesis and ketosis as a way of life, a way of living. Like, this is, this is incredible. I can cut out all my carbs and get rid of all my fruits and certainly all the grains and pastas and everything else and most of my vegetables and just eat steak and butter and this is going to be awesome, even more awesome than before. Um, if chronic cardio is bad, then I'm just going to do high-intensity stuff. I'm going to join a CrossFit box. I'm going to do 12 to 17 minutes a day, three times a week, and, and, and that'll be it. Um, we started to embrace this idea that all sugar kills. So you look for the label, and if there's any sugar or evaporated cane juice or any derivation thereof, then I am not getting it, I'm not buying it, that's out, and the same goes for industrial seed oils, and the same goes for any form of refined carbs. Made a lot of sense, and we embrace that. Um, hey, if it's not grass-fed, wild, line-caught, pastured, then um, I'm fine. I don't need to eat. I'll, I'll, I'll wait till the next meal. Can we, can we see if there's a restaurant down the street that serves some stuff? Um, we became sort of a pain in the ass to dine with because of this attachment to this paradigm that we'd set for ourselves, this, this ultra-prescribed um, and proscribed dogma. Um, legumes, I mean, you know, for the longest time, a lot, we, we were under the impression that legumes and beans and hummus and any bean plates were going to be uh, healthful for us and, and, and good for us to eat. And now all of a sudden they're full of lectins and phytates and saponins and, and oh my God, all these things that are going to kill me. And what I, so we, we couldn't eat legumes anymore. And then it just became, all right, well, bacon must be the go-to the go -to thing. We got so involved in this, a lot of us started to get this into this sort of spiral where we'd get a little bit of results and then the results would stop 
working. And we got to the point where, well, if I, if I don't look good naked, I must be doing this wrong because there's a template and I see the template and I'm following it to the letter of the law and damn it, if I'm doing everything and I'm, I'm eating my saturated fat and my, I'm, I'm consuming my grass-fed whatever it is and I'm, now I've hit a plateau and oh, by the way, my energy levels are now plummeting and my um, thyroid is low and so we started to see what happens sometimes when you take this dogma and you push it too far over to the right. So some of us simply stopped having fun and it became kind of a, kind of a drudgery uh, in this community and I didn't like seeing that. Part of the problem is that we got too attached to the numbers, getting my blood work done, getting my all, every version of my arm circumference and waist circumference and whatever thigh circumference measured. We were putting on the Fitbits and the jaw bones and measuring how many steps we took and, and the HRV monitors and the lactate threshold devices and everything, trying to prove to ourselves that we were on the right track, headed toward a long, healthy life, but, but kind of miserable in the process. And, and it's like, okay, now we're, we're, we're undergoing this routine that we've embraced, but we're doing so with a plan of maybe when I get down to my ideal weight, then I'll be happy, and then I'll be content, and then I'll be satisfied. But right now, you know, if I really tell the truth, I'm, I'm still kind of miserable. I'm still not getting it. I'm still not digging it. And it comes back to how do you feel? It really does come back to how do you feel? All of these things, all this quantifiable self, all this N equals one experimentation, is meaningless if you don't feel great. If you don't feel joy, contentment, satisfaction in your life now, right now, lack of pain, uh, energy, uh, some great anticipation of the next, the next hour, the next day. And so what we're seeing, which I'm hoping to promote, and I hope we do more of this, is that we've realized that, you know, some fats are great for sure. I don't want to throw that out, fats are great in moderation, you know, but a bowl of, of uh, Kerrygold butter for breakfast is probably not an appropriate choice, um, except for Jimmy, and that's fine, I could, I could <laughs> uh, grains and legumes could be, you know, could be fine for some people, um, it's not a matter of all or nothing, some people do okay with some grains, I, I don't, wheat still kills me, and and uh, a number of grains I stay away from, but I've discovered that legumes are okay for me. Uh, so it may be that we've excluded some of these things from our diet, possibly unnecessarily, depending on who you are. Certainly we, we've learned in the last uh, year or two, carbohydrates can be tailored to a lifestyle. If, you've, if you're doing any form of aerobic activity or certainly some form of glycolytic activity, you probably need to top off your, carbo your glycogen stores at the end of a night before a workout with some safe starches. That much we know uh, over the past few years. So yes, there's a range of carbohydrate intake, but to arbitrarily restrict your carbs to say zero to 50 grams a day um, might not be necessary for a lot of people. There may be a, a, a greater range, and that greater range might allow you to enjoy a wider variety of foods. And as I said in a prior, um, talk on the panel here, I don't put anything into my mouth that doesn't taste great. So if I want to include more great tasting foods, I want that variety of foods. Uh, ketosis, it's a good tool. It's a great tool. And in some cases, if you've got some neurological issues or um, maybe you're battling cancer at the time, um, ketosis is a, is, a, is a wonderful tool and strategy. But it's probably not a way of life for a lot of people because it restricts a lot of the pleasure that we would otherwise get from vegetables and some starchy tubers and some other uh, forms of food. Um, some uh, cardio can have a, a place in our lives. Cardio is certainly, people call me up and they go, they literally call me up, they, they get my number from the office, hey Mark, I'm thinking about doing a 10K, is that okay with you? It's like, I didn't really, I didn't intend for this to be like a zero cardio movement, I just said, don't frickin' do it every single day at a high heart rate. So we're, we're starting to come back to this, this middle range. Now, LGN, look good naked, has become 
feel good naked. And that's huge to me. That's a very significant change in this movement because not everybody has the genes to, to appear on the cover of Flex Magazine or Shape Magazine or whatever. And what's really critical is how do you feel in your body? Are you comfortable with your body? Do you love yourself no matter where you are in your journey? So that becomes an important little shift that we've had in the movement away from, well, this is, none of this is going to be worth it until I got a six pack and I could sh you know, uh, show vascularity on my knees. <clears throat> so the key to primal happiness is Wikiga. And that is, what can I get away with? So, life is just a series of choices we make. You know, there have been some uh, memes throughout the internet over the years and prior to that through uh, anonymous quotation books that life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we respond. We are always making choices. And there are no right or wrong choices in life. I'm just, I'm here to allow you that as of right now. There are no right or wrong choices in life. There's no good or bad. There's no black or white. There are simply choices. <clears throat> and my job, as I see it, is to allow you to understand that some of the choices that I'm offering you are likely to get you to an outcome that you are seeking perhaps a little bit more quickly than some other choices that you might be considering. And the purpose of the N equals one experiment exercise is really to explore the periphery of the boundaries, if you will, of, of behaviors and foods that could offer some amount of, of pleasure and in the short term uh, and that don't compromise uh, short or long term health. So with this experimentation, we can start to see what can I get away with. For example, um, in some cases, sugar, some people, hey, they really have a tough time with sugar. And I'm not going to suggest that you go out and down a bowl of Skittles right now. There are some people who have a tough time with sugar. But some people have maybe, just because they told everyone they were paleo or primal, uh, have avoided sugar maybe unnecessarily. What is sugar? It's evaporated cane juice. It's a, if you really drill down to the essence of table sugar, it's pretty primal, just not in the quantities that we that the typical American would consume it. So it's an issue now of the dose makes the poison. And some amounts of sugar are not only appropriate, but add flavor, add a little bit of, of added nuance, nuance is the word of the weekend, uh, to, to whatever meal that you're consuming. Um, but the bottom line is, and we can talk about this with, with legumes and with how much you know, cardio is appropriate for you if you're a well-trained endurance athlete, you don't just go cold turkey and only do high intensity stuff. You can put some in and if that makes you, if that gives you pleasure and if you feel good doing it, then do it. This is the essence of what we're discussing today. So any choice in my mind is a good choice if you do it mindfully and if you own it. In other words, if you say, I'm gonna do a 10K um, because I wanna prove to my ex-wife that I'm worthy of love. <laughs> if that's your reason for doing the 10K and you own it, then I'm okay. I'm not gonna judge your, 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 your reasons for that. So how do you choose? How do you decide like, what, what is gonna happen with your life and how you're going to make these choices because life is so confusing? So I came up with an algorithm. Um, the value of short-term pleasure of the proposed behavior divided by the increased risk for disease or discomfort times one over the coefficient of guilt, how bad you're going to feel for having made that decision, equals C, where C is the, the higher C is, the better your choice is. And we are introducing an app with this next week. No, we're not. No. I got some of you. Um, that's bullshit. Um, <clears throat> Why don't you just simply develop a strong sense of intuition about your decisions and your choices? And this is, again, this is my job at Mark's Daily Apple and the Primal Blueprint, is I want for you, this is my dream for you, to be able to cruise through life making decisions on the fly that serve you in the, in the moment and that serve you in the long term. And those decisions, when you make them, 
You have no attachment to the outcome. You made it willingly. You made it with some knowledge of the science behind the decision. You know what happens if you eat a huge piece of chocolate cake. You know what's going to happen. And, and if you're okay with that, and you understand that, the, that your blood sugar is going to go up, and insulin is going to rise, and your heart's going to start racing faster, and you're going to get night sweats, and you might get restless leg syndrome, and you might not sleep all night, and your heart might... Be, whatever. If you understand all that, and then in the context of maybe it's your five-year-old's birthday. Oh, no, honey, I can't have you have cake. I can't have cake because I'm paleo. No, have a piece of cake. In the context of, of life, sometimes these choices, you just make them on the fly, and you're okay with them. We talk about balance, and we talk about the notion of, well, you know, I could drink a lot of NorCal margaritas because they have no carbs in them, um, or I could just not drink at all, and that would be another choice, and there's nothing in between. There's lots in between. So balance in your life is, is critical to your ability to make a decision on the fly that serves you in the, in the moment, that gives you pleasure in the moment, that doesn't compromise long-term health, and that, and that allows you to feel like life is awesome, and I'm just, I'm not constrained by any boundaries that Mark Sisson set, or that Rob Wolf set, or that Dallas and Melissa set, it's just, you, you, you understand the context, you understand all of the ramifications with some, so we call that mindfulness, that you're, you're understanding about making a, a choice. Um, and I've had times in my life when I lost that whole mindfulness thing. I had my identity stolen three years ago, and I'm still fighting it on a regular basis because I wasn't mindful when I was multitasking on a computer and on a phone call at one time. So, you know, when you make choices, mindfulness becomes a very critical part of, of that choice. I just want you to be in the moment. Uh, a lot of times we know what to do. That's the gut sense. That's not just the gut biome telling us what to do, but that's the gut telling us this is a good choice and it's fine and, and let's live with it. Sometimes you want to reframe the context around a choice. Uh, so you might say, well, uh, you have an opportunity to speak at Paleo FX in front of uh, several hundred people this weekend. Somebody might say, oh my God, this is the worst day of my life. I'm going to die. I can't do this. This is terrible. Somebody else might say, this is the best day of my life. Can you believe this? I get to talk in front of all these people and tell them what I think. Same exact situation, but if you reframe it one way or the other, you can put it into a com completely different motivation uh, and derive either extreme pleasure or extreme pain from doing that. But the bottom line is choose and move on with no regrets. So I want to talk a little bit about my own personal epigenetic tweaks in the last few years, but certainly in the last year. Um, I've written a lot about red wine, um, and a lot of the research on red wine is compelling. It says that people who drink two red glasses of red wine a night, uh, men and women who drink one, uh, tend to live longer than teetotalers. That's pretty compelling research in and of itself. But when you drill down, you realize that they took an unhealthy population and they divided it into two cohorts, and those that drank wine probably had their blood thinned enough that they didn't get a, a, a heart attack that night versus those who, who, who didn't drink the wine at all. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of nuance uh, behind the, um, these studies, but the reality is ethanol in red wine is, is toxic. Well, I've been drinking two glasses of red wine a night for ever since I stopped drinking two six-packs of beer a night. Uh, <laughs> for a long time. And I thought, you know, I'm fine. At least I think I'm fine. Um, but I'm going to re-examine my assumptions about red wine and, and uh, do an experiment. I'll go 30 days without drinking wine. How can I do that? Um, because for me, it wasn't about the wine. It was about the ritual of dinner. And this, this also brought up uh, other, other stuff for me. But the bottom line is, um, I had an attachment to drinking red wine with dinner, and I was willing to give that up for 30 days to see what happened. And the first thing I noticed was uh, I, get, I slept better. I didn't wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and stay awake for an hour thinking about all the crap I had to do the next day. Even though I assumed that that was part of my lifestyle because I run a, a business with a lot of employees and I have a lot of stuff going on, that went away. So I started sleeping better, and I started feeling a little bit better when I woke up. The 30 days, I said at the end of 30 days, I thought, well, this is pretty cool, um, but I'm missing something with that ritual, so I found a replacement for it, and I, I found um, 
a non-alcoholic beer that I drink one of at uh, night, and it's a cold, uh, just so you know, it's like either a Bex or a Poly Girl uh, non-alcoholic beer, and that completed my dinner. That dinner is now better than it was with the red wine, and now when I drink red wine, if I do, it might be one glass a week. I, it doesn't even taste that good anymore. So I, I sort of re-examined my assumption about red wine. I've moved away from that. I feel better as a result of it. I don't think I'll ever go back to drinking more wine than that because, you know, intuitively, I understand that, that ethanol is toxic and dose makes the poison. Um, and, you know, having said that, my kids will tell you, my wife will tell you, they've never seen me drunk. It's not, it wasn't about uh, anything other than taking the edge off and the ritual. So there's that. Um, I want to talk about the MED of food, the minimum effective dose of food. Uh, I did a thought experiment a few years ago. <clears throat> I, I probably, like most of you, I spent most of my life thinking, what's the most amount of food I can eat and not gain weight? How much food can I shove down my pie hole and still maintain my body composition? And that became the set point of what my diet was. And it was a copious amount of food for a skinny guy like me. But then a few years ago, I noticed my wife commented. She said, You're, you eat less than I do. What's, what's going on here? And my wife is very fit and, and uh, trim, and I don't eat less than she does, so just so you know. I thought, well, let me, let me do a reverse thought experiment. What's the least amount of food I can eat and maintain muscle mass and maintain energy and not get hungry? And it turned out that it was, that was very, a, a very compelling difference. It was about 30% fewer calories than I'd eaten for most of my life. The minimum effective dose of food. So, and I, I thought, well, if, if I'm doing paleo and I'm doing pretty, I do pretty low carb most of the time, so it must be this, this anorectic effect of the low carb diet that's causing it, and maybe there's something wrong with that. And the answer is there's nothing wrong with it. Maintain my energy, maintain my muscle mass, um, don't get sick, and I'm not hungry. And that's, there's, it's so freeing to not be hungry. And it's so freeing to, to understand that there's nothing wrong with that, that I'm fine, that it's, it really is a question of maybe all of us are consuming too many calories because we can get away with it. So maybe try a, a reverse sort of thought experiment that way. Um, one of the things that I suggest people do is kind of reframe old fears. Uh, I grew up in Maine, uh, so I learned, well, I, I had two near-death drowning experiences, one at five and one at 12. I learned to swim in water that barely got up to the 50s. So I've had this aversion of cold water m my entire life. Um, and I've had a, an aversion to swimming. And that's why I became an Ironman triathlete. <laughs> no, I just did it because I needed something else to do. But the whole time I was doing triathlon, I hated getting into an 81 degree public pool. Any amount of cold, any water that was colder than my body temperature, man, was cold water. So I thought about a year and a half, two years ago, I thought, you know, I'm going to reframe this because I have this, this silly notion that 81 degree water is 17 degrees colder than my body and therefore it's you know, it's, it's, it's not good, it's painful for me to get in. So I reframed it, it's cold water, isn't, it's not about pain, it's a sensation, a sensation. And if I can get past that and I can start to retrain myself to, um, to adapt to colder water, I'll get, I'll get rid of some of those painful childhood memories. So I started keeping my pool unheated. Uh, and in the wintertime, even in, in Southern California, my pool gets down to the high 40s, low 50s in January and February. So every night, my wife and I had this, this is an awesome ritual now, after we've finished watching Game of Thrones. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'm very fortunate to, uh, I'll admit that, to have a pool and a jacuzzi and a fire pit all together. So I crank up the fire pit, turn off all the lights in the house, and then I walk into the pool without gasping or groaning or shuddering. I walk into the pool, hang out for a couple of minutes until I'm very, very... Um, shivering, but I don't sense it as cold anymore. Get in the jacuzzi, hang out, have a sort of share the end of the day with my wife. We, we go to bed and uh, I sleep like a baby. It's unbelievable. It's become such a great ritual. And to, to take what had been this scary concept of cold water and turn it into something that I look forward to every single night, and I know is good for me, by the way, because that's, that's critical to all this, 
Um, very freeing, very empowering. Um, I'm going to suggest you make minor modifications. I've had, um, boy, that's alliterative, make minor modifications in minimalist shoes. Uh, anyway, I've, you, you guys know I've worn Vibrams for a long time. And I started getting a Achilles tendinosis, uh, which is a thickening of the Achilles, and it was bothering me. And I, I went to an orthopedic guy, and he said, um, well, you know, we can go in there, and we can scrape it out, and we can sew it back together again or whatever. And we can." I said, what's the downtime? He said, well, six months to a year. Not having any of that. So I went back, and I realized I, the strap on the back of my uh, Vibrams cuts right across my Achilles. And when I'm doing sprints or doing stuff with... Uh, with Ultimate Frisbee, I'm tightening it down every a couple of minutes during a game to make sure it's on tight, and it was cutting into the Achilles. Stopped doing that, increased my, my intake of uh, bone broth, and it's basically gone. So I could be here on crutches saying, okay, well, I'm poor bastard, I had a, you know Achilles problem and I had an operation, but I knew what to do, and I, and I made a minor adjustment to that. Same with a stand-up desk. I've been at a stand-up desk for five or six years now, but it turns out we aren't meant to, <laughs> just hunter-gatherers weren't meant to sit all day. They also weren't meant to stand in one place all day. So I got a leaning post. I got a focal upright leaning post, and now I've modified that so that I, I enjoy the prospect of going to work and writing on a regular basis. So minor modifications. I've introduced legumes back into my diet, um, partly because my wife enjoys hummus and some kind of bean dips and things like that, but I realized that, that my gut biome has healed itself over the past several years. And it may have been, and it may be for you, that many of you don't eat legumes, partly because you haven't, you haven't done the work on your biome to where you've got the correct bacteria that are expecting this form of resistant starch, this form of, of, of substrate for them to thrive on. And I realized, wow, I've, I've been depriving myself of legumes just because Lauren Cordain told me that they contain uh, lectins that could destroy the lining of my gut, and yet they don't. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't hurt. It, it, it adds to the pleasure and the enjoyment of a meal. I want to incorporate the greatest amount of, of food that I can in my, in my meal. Um, sometimes we do everything we think is right. We, do, we, we dot the I's and cross the T's, particularly in the paleo primal template. We cut the, the, the grains and the legumes. We cut out the the uh, industrial seed oils, we reduce the amount of uh, processed foods, uh, we're watching what we're doing, we're sprinting, we're walking, uh, we're getting lots of sleep, and still we're stuck. And this was the case of my wife's personal assistant. She had been, she's been with us for <clears throat> five years, maybe six, and had a, a, a pretty bad weight problem. She could not get rid of the weight. And she would come to our house and she'd feel bad because she's hanging out with me and, and my wife. And she could not shed the pounds. And it was, she, she felt guilty about it. She felt like a failure. She felt miserable. She was, I, at one point, she claimed she was taking in 1,200 calories a day. I didn't believe her. And then she said, I mean, it was, it was really kind of bad. And ultimately, we decided, look, there's something going on with you and you need to dig deeper. You need to figure out what's going on and why you're holding on to this weight. She found a great therapist and she started going to regular therapy. She discovered that she'd had a traumatic experience. Um, she didn't discover, she'd, she'd known it all along, but she'd hidden it, hidden it from us. And she dealt with this traumatic experience that happened to her when she was between 19 and 20. And it was a, a sexual trauma. And once she got past that, she's now down 40 pounds. So she was holding on to armor. She was holding on to something that was, that despite all of her best intentions and, and trying and trying and trying to lose the weight, she was unable to lose it until she let go of what it was that was really running her life, until she dug deeper. She was willing to dig deeper. So that's, that's a pretty compelling argument for taking a look at everything in your life and, and determining, you know, how do you feel? Because you say you feel good, you say you're pain-free right now, you say that, that, that all of this is going on, but really, you know, if you dig deep, how do you feel? And do you feel good? And are you doing everything you can to 
to get the most joy and contentment and pleasure and satisfaction out of every moment of every, of every day of your life. Because that's really all there is. When I say that's all there is, yeah, they're kids and they're great. They give you satisfaction and joy, so they're part of that, that's all there is. Um, your work, maybe that gives you satisfaction and joy. So what I'm suggesting to you is find the joy wherever you possibly can. Use the paleo primal world as a template. Don't consider it dogmatic, don't consider a religion, but, but it's a series and a set of possible good choices. And hopefully many of these fit within your lifestyle, but if some of them don't, so be it, it's fine. Make mindful choices, make intuitive choices, be okay with whatever happens. If you make one that in retrospect was the wrong choice, just, get, just make the next good choice if that's what you're going to do. But don't get caught up in the guilt and the second guessing of your abilities or your commitment or any of that. Just if you make mindful choices, they'll happen and they will happen organically and they will happen intuitively. And that's, again, if you read the research and you, and you go to the blogs and you understand some of the biochemistry and some of the balance and some of the context, you'll be fine. So I'll just leave you with that. This, this, this life is about making choices, no right or wrong, good or bad. I'm not going to judge any choice you make, but I want you to feel good about your choices, make them, and have no regrets. Can we agree to do that? Cool. Yeah. Um, so, can we take some questions? So, you were talking about, um, that you touched on taking in too much food at some point and um, people not taking in enough food. I just, out of curiosity, how do you feel about living a zone paleo kind of two worlds coming together like that sort of mentality oh i gotta weigh i gotta measure everything you know i've got goals i've got all this aesthetic stuff to take care of and then you know calories do matter because if you're eating too much you're not eating enough so zone being a template for knowing exactly how much to take in for your body type how do you feel about it in the paleo mm -hmm. aspect so based on what i just said I would suggest that if it's working for you, keep doing what you're doing. If it's not working for you, find ways to tweak it, to experiment a little bit, to maybe dig a little bit deeper. Um, the reality is that while calories in, calories out became this hated equation and s somehow involved the second law of thermodynamics and you know we all got caught up in it, the truth is if you want to lose weight, you have to you have to burn off more calories than you store. So we can talk about all of the um, dynamics of, of, of hormone manipulation and all the stuff that's going on internally, but the reality is if you simply burn off more calories than you store, you will lose weight. And some of that is almost interdependent on the amount or independent of the amount of food you take in. It may, may have to do with, again, something that's going on in your mind. It's, that's, uh, that may be causing you to hold on to weight. It may have to do with uh, hormonal issues that, that you may have uh, either developed recently or uh, have been manifesting over a lifetime. But it really is about experimenting. I mean, the, look, the, if people ask me to, to, to drill down and give them the essential element of the primal blueprint, well, first of all, it's to, it's to, it's to live awesome, to experience life to its fullest. Within the context of the dietary aspect, it's to become good at burning fat. And it doesn't mean you become uh, ketogenic for your whole life. It doesn't mean you, that you do any other thing other than I just want you to get a sense of how, how freeing it is to be able to go through life and, and, and not be hungry for an, another meal every two or three hours. So the, the amount of fat burning that you're good at could be as simple as, well, I can, just, I can skip a meal and I don't get cranky. It may, you may be so good at it, you can go 36 hours without eating and not get cranky and not lose body mass and, and, and not have anything neg negative happen. Uh, but it's, it really is about um, developing the skills to become a fat burner and not so dependent on sugar. Now, again, when I talk about uh, uh, all this, it's in the context of what can I get away with. Some people can get, 
I'm really good at burning fat, and I don't, I'm not negatively af affected by sugar or a certain amount of carbohydrate. So I, can, I, don't, I don't like to take in excessive amounts of carbs, so I rarely take in more than 200 grams a day, and most days I take in 100 to 120. That's plenty sufficient for me. And, and when I'm finished eating, I'm, I'm happy to push the plate away, and that's it. So we developed a skill to, to burn fat, and then we play around with, with, the, what, with what can I get away with. I think my question is, is paleo a choice of food, or is it a philosophy of life? Well, so, <laughs> semantics here. Um, primal blueprint is a philosophy of life. Paleo has, is becoming a philosophy of life, but is primarily now a way of eating. Um, it started out strictly as a way of eating and has, has incorporated more of the nuances uh, of primal. But primal blueprint was always a way of life. It really was about um, certainly dialing in the diet because the, the part about the diet, which is most compelling, again, if you, if you want to be pain-free and have energy and, and have the strength to move around life and, ex and play and explore, then it really does start with diet. So you, you, you can't avoid the dietary component of a happy, healthy, productive life. That has to be there. You can't have the other things if you're making choices that are based on pizza and, um, and, and Diet Coke. I mean, I'm not to suggest that that's, those are bad choices, but that's a choice that won't get you to... To, to the point where you're energetic and, and have mobility and, and all these things that we seek. So, um, so the primal blueprint is, has always been a way of life, and paleo is, is, is getting there. Uh, so neither of them are, are strictly ways of eating anymore. They become much more encompass, all-encompassing. Uh, so we have migrated to the eating similar to you, where we don't eat until maybe noon or one is our first meal. Uh, we feel amazing since we've done that. My question is, I actually have two children, um, and so the school of thought has always been they wake up, they eat breakfast before they go to school. So what is your take on that kind of uh, intermittent fasting style eating for kids? So the reason I don't eat until noon or one is because I'm not hungry until noon or one. Bottom line. Um, if I were hungry, if I woke up hungry, I would eat. Uh, I don't. So back to whatever gives you the greatest amount of pleasure with the least amount of sacrificing of health, um, if, you, if you haven't gotten to the point where you can uh, go long periods of time without eating, I don't want you to, to, to not eat. I mean, that's one of the basic elements of the primal blueprint is do not go hungry. But, but do develop the skills to where you don't get that hungry that often because you're so reliant on stored body fat. Uh, and it's, again, totally empowering and, and probably... Um, an ant, part of an anti-aging strategy. But for kids, look, if kids wake up hungry, feed them. I mean, for kids, that's breakfast will be the most important meal of the day until, until they say one day, hey, I want to do what you guys do, and I'm fine, I'm comfortable doing that. Um, you know, it, it, kids have a different metabolism. They take a, a different approach to um, how they segment their day with activity. And there are a lot of a lot of uh, aspects to that that would be taken into consideration. I wouldn't, I wouldn't force intermittent fasting on any child, and I'm not suggesting that you are, but, but I would say, you know, if, uh, if all you use as a guideline is ha tapping in fully to your awareness, your mindfulness of, am I really hungry, or am I just, oh, it's noon, and I better eat. You know, that's kind of the, the skill that we develop within the primal blueprint, is this, is this understanding uh, when I'm hungry, and how much is enough? In other words, am I, as I'm getting through my meal, am I hungry for the next bite? And if the answer is no, then there's no sense really in continuing. I mean, you could, but then you're going to, now you, now you border into the, oh, oh, I ate too much, I'm full. And then, that, then the guilt comes in. I, I mean, I, I had an idea for a book years ago, which, which basically made the basic premise that everybody has an unhealthy relationship with food. And it's not just anorexia and bulimia and binge purge, but it could be, oh, shit, I can't believe I ate that whole bowl of ice cream. I mean, that's an unhealthy relationship with food, to feel guilty after having done something that was otherwise pleasurable. But that's the mindfulness. That's the balance. That's the thing where you go, all right, um, you know, if you say large, you say I'm going to have a enter an eating contest and I'm going to have, uh, you know, 40 hot dogs because I want, this is a challenge. 
if that's what you're doing mindfully and you know you're going to feel like crap for the next two days, I'm okay with that. And, and you ought to, because you know you'll come out of that, okay? But I'm not, that's not something I would do because I'd say, I, I just, the, or, or, or the, the, uh, the pecan, the whole pecan pie kind of thing, or the slice of pecan, not a whole pecan, but a slice of pecan pie. It's like, um, is four minutes of gustatory pleasure worth the next five hours of, of high heart rate, sweating, uh, you know, heart palpitations, feeling like crap, bloating, gas, irritable, irritable bowel syndrome, restless leg syndrome, and all the other stuff that I happen to know is going to come with this? And the answer is pretty, pretty much no. You know, it's just, it's, it, it's, that's, that's the intuitive ability I want for everybody to develop to go, you know what, I could, and you know what, I'll have two bites, because two bites, you know, as, that's the what can I get away with. That's the what can I get away with. So it's not like you avoid it entirely, it's that you understand your limitations and, and you go, okay, two bites, I got it, I know what this tastes like, it's awesome, and I know if I have 75 bites of it, I'm going to regret it, and it's going to be redundant, and it's not going to matter, and it's not going to add any more pleasure than the two bites did. Make sense? Yes. Um, how do you find the balance between enjoying life as it is right now and changing what needs to be changed? Um, wow, that's a philosophical question. So. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, first of all, you, you know, you, you have to be the one to decide if you want to change. I can't, I'm not going to convince you to change. As far as I'm concerned, your life is awesome. And you might be going home and ordering pizza and having a six-pack of Coke and playing Worlds of Warcraft until 4 o'clock Sunday morning. Um, but you're at level 70 and you're king of the world. <laughs> And I'm not going to. And I'm not going to say your life sucks. So you, you, you know, you got to be the one to to decide. And that's how a lot of people come to the Primal Blueprint and Paleo. Is everything I've tried up to now didn't work. You know, it's sort of a last resort for a lot of people. If you're fit already, most people who are fit already. They either sort of already do this, but, you know, they want to find out more about it, or they don't do it because what they're doing works for them. People who come to the Primal Blueprint. Um, Larry's a great example. Every, tried everything else, didn't work. Was frustrated, just like, damn it, I want to do the right thing, and, and what they're telling me to do isn't working. So they come to the Primal Blueprint, and they go, oh, this is interesting. I can eat more fat. I don't have to exercise as much. Um, I get to sleep more. I'm, I'm all in. Uh, it's pretty attractive on the outset. Um, but you have to want to change. And so with regard to balance, you're the, you're the one who has to tell me there's not enough balance in my life, you know, and, and what is that? I don't even know what balance means for someone your age. It could be, um, you know, I'm getting, um, I'm getting good grades, I'm playing sports, and I get stoned every night. Is that a good balance? I don't know. If, if it's working for you, it's working for you. But if it's not, something's got to change, and that's where the experiment comes in. And you go, you know what, I don't feel that great about getting stoned every night. I'm not, I'm not suggesting anything, but, uh, but, I'm, but I am saying that, that that's, you know, we... we but, you know, uh, firing up a bone once a week is not, I'm not going to, you know, judge that either. If it's just, ba that's the balance part of it. So, you have to be the one to decide and come to this with sort of, you know, a clear mind. Like, th these, these are, th this is what I want to change about my life. I want to find more joy. I want to find more pleasure. I want to experience the excitement. I want to have no pain. I want to walk through life. I mean, I can't tell you, personally, when I get in the car and drive anywhere now, and I, am, and I don't have pain in my gut, which disappeared 14 years ago. To this day, I am thankful. I have gratitude. God, I just feel awesome. And awesome for me is just a lack of pain. It isn't like I've got some, I'm on some high. I'm just, I just feel like, wow, this is how you're supposed to feel. Most of my life, if I were to get in the car and drive to the airport to fly to Austin, I would be going, okay, where's the gas station with the bathroom open on the way to the airport? Because I know I'm going to have to, I mean, it was that, that's how I lived my life. So, you know, little things can, can add up to a lot in one's life. And with anybody who's in pain, getting rid of that pain, which otherwise sort of drives your... It, it, pain for a lot of people is, is always present, and, it's, and it's, it proscribes their entire experience of life. It, it defines their entire experience of life. And that's just really, really sad, because in my mind, that doesn't have to happen that way. Um, 
Another question? One in the back there. Okay, hi. hi. Thank you. Um, so my question is a little more personal and a little bit like what you just answered. I have plenty of internal motivation and I'm pretty happy with where I'm at. I've been doing this for about four years and had pretty incredible health turnaround and transformation. Um, I do blog a little, but I don't push it down friends and family's throats. But I've definitely been surprised that the longer I do this, I sort of have not meant to, but it drives a wedge between uh, myself and then other friends and family members whom I'm crazy about and really love, but it's like the healthier and the more balanced and the more awesome I'm feeling, um, the more it really, it just makes things challenging. Um, and I didn't know if you had any, I mean, you're very eloquent and I always like hearing you speak. If you had any words of wisdom or ways to make peace with the fact that it changes things. In what way is it challenging? Challenging for me or, um, like, I feel ch I have super healthy kids and my household has totally embraced this and we do it. And like I said, I'm not a pushy, like, you have to do this or I won't eat your food. But I don't know, you just sort of become the weirdo and you get in invited to stuff less. I mean, you know, like... Do you want I, to get I invited mean, to stuff less? Well, or? I really love my parents, and they're getting older, and yeah. they're not really on board, and they're having their medical issues, and there's lots of doctor's visits, and this and that and the other, and, like, I want to be supportive. But, like, it just... I don't know. I mean, I don't think I'm the only one who experiences this. I hear other people say the same thing, but just any ideas for how, like, you yeah, yeah. make peace? Well, first of all, um, and I'm not suggesting that you are, but don't be militant about it. Don't, be, don't, hold, don't put it in their face. Don't hold it in their, right in front of them and say, look what I'm doing and you're not. Um, this is a very personal decision that a lot of people make to come to Paleo or the Primal Blueprint. And um, a lot of times, like I say, they, get, they go all in, they go full primal or militant Paleo, and, and it's a turnoff to a lot of people who who would otherwise like to hang out with you, but, but when you say, well, we can't go to that restaurant because they don't serve grass-fed this or line-caught that, um, that's where I would say, okay, if that's an issue, then, then the way around that is to say, you know what, I, and, and I'll tell you this, I can go to any restaurant in this town and order a meal that I will be perfectly satisfied with, either, either it's uh, an adaptation of what's on the menu, or I ask the waiter to go back and ask the chef if he can do this, this, and this, and typically they'll do that. So, so you know, I, I encounter people who are who are afraid to go out to dinner with friends unless they go to their restaurant. Uh, and one example. So there are other examples of this too, but, but as I said in an earlier conversation, it's not your job to change the world. It's your job to feed your kids and love your kids and, and your husband and take care of your parents and, and nurture uh, and, 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 and enjoy that process. But as far as friends are concerned, I guarantee you that you and I could sit down and craft a way in which you could interact with your friends and they would, they would, they would even know your paleo, really. Um, you know, unless they invite you to, to their house for a lasagna dinner <laughs> with bread, in which case, and you say, well, I'm not hungry. But there, there, are, ways, there are ways around this. And um, we're, we're back to how do you extract the greatest pleasure from life. And if, you, and if you're allowing yourself to be um, to become the martyr, the, the paleo martyr, because your kids are healthy and you're healthy and you've changed your life, but, but uh, those around you aren't buying it or aren't buying in. It's not your job to change your life, so, so figure out a way that you can still interact with them and still have that relationship, if that's what you want, uh, with them, and, and extract the greatest joy possible from that moment, making mindful choices. Does that make sense? All right, um, thank you so much for attending. I hope you enjoy the rest of the weekend.